Hello and welcome once again, wherever you may be on the surface of this planet, the planet Certain Death. I'm going to look over some of Mr. Gurdjieff's more subtle material today. I visited the Nyman's country estate, which is a 600 acre manor house that's now a museum that you can visit with rolling hills and ornamental gardens and a collection of very beautiful and unusual trees from around the world. And I always notice in places like this the very faint fragrances of the different trees, of the different shrubs and bushes and flowers, and how they all feel just a little different. Of course, it is very unnatural for so many different types of trees to be gathered together like this. And those fragrances enter inside the body, and they must have some kind of chemical reaction inside, which is why I prefer some and I dislike others. And I turn towards the sun, with the misty valley flowing away from me, to see if I could feel those astral elements that Gurdjieff says are in actually the air that we breathe, the air that must be full of many things and that goes into the body. What is happening there? In the lower story, the food that we eat is carefully packaged and sits on the plate, but not so the air, we are surrounded by the air. It is much more free-flowing. And then in the third story we have impressions, the light and the sound that goes into the orifices at the highest point in the organism. You have the mouth, nostrils, and then the eyes ascending. And the light flows even more quickly and more universally than the air. And those impressions are pouring into us. I'm sure we've all heard about the breathing exercises that spiritual people do. But what exercises are they really? What do they mean by breathing exercises? They count, they breathe in through one nostril or the other they breathe deeper or more shallow. This is quite a small idea of breathing exercises because material is entering inside of you with the breathing, if only you could detect what it is. And that would be a completely different world of breathing exercises. And those are the three worlds, the world of impressions, the world of the air, and the physical world. And the breathing exercises that people do are understood only on the physical level, according to the movement of the air against the body, the movement of the belly, the movement of the nostrils. Human culture only includes information that comes from the physical plane. Whilst I'm on this subject, I was thinking this morning about a black lady that I used to dance with at a Latin club, and she would come regularly, and she was very good. She was very typical of black people. She experiences her body very differently from white people, as well as a particular fragrance that black people tend to have. Her hands are swarthy and strong, and black people tend not to talk very much. The Latin girls I used to dance with are very emotional and chat a lot. And then the Western women, the white women, their bodies tend to be very limp, their rhythm rubbish, but they're very heady. And this seems to be the distribution of qualities that the different races have or had originally. Of course, there are also the Chinese, the Japanese, Southeast Asians, the Muslims, but but I just want to have a quick look at this. 
black people, even if they represent the physical tranche in its relationship to each other, it does not mean that black people only do physical things. Of course, it's not like that. They have the whole emotional life, the whole intellectual life. But fundamentally, as a cosmic unit, they are processing energy differently from people in the second story and people in the first story. Mr. Gurger. All the substances necessary for the maintenance of the life of the organism, for psychic work, for the higher functions of consciousness and the growth of the higher bodies, are produced by the organism from the food which enters it from outside. The human organism receives three kinds of food, the ordinary food we eat, the air we breathe, and our impressions. It is not difficult to agree that air is a kind of food for the organism, but in what way impressions can be food may appear at first difficult to understand. We must, however, remember that with every external impression, whether it takes the food of sound or vision or smell, we receive from outside a certain amount of energy, a certain number of vibrations. This energy which enters the organism from outside is food. Moreover, as has been said before, energy cannot be transmitted without matter. If an external impression brings external energy with it into the organism, it means that external matter also enters which feeds the organism in the full meaning of the term. The organism can exist for a comparatively long time without a supply of fresh physical food. Without air he can exist only for a few minutes not more than two or three, as a rule a man dies after being four minutes without air. Without impressions a man cannot live a single moment. If the flow of impressions were to be stopped in some way, or if the organism were deprived of its capacity for receiving impressions, it would immediately die. The flow of impressions coming to us from outside is like a driving belt communicating motion to us. The principal motor for us is nature, the surrounding world. Nature transmits to us through our impressions the energy by which we live and move and have our being. If the inflow of this energy is arrested, our machine will immediately stop working. The process of transforming the substances which enter the organism into finer ones is governed by the law of octaves. Hmm. Well, some people might say that according to this we should always prefer more beautiful impressions. We should always prefer more beautiful feelings because bad feelings produce bad karma. But in fact that is the attitude of a consumer, not a transformer. A man who is active, who is living, is transforming what is dark into what is light. And for that, he requires at least a certain amount of negative everything. That's why when spiritual people talk about being positive or happy or always in the light or always saving the world, they have completely lost the sense of transforming anything. 
and Gurdjieff used to shout at his students. Uh, later on, he would fix things up. He gave them both sides. He gave them a blue line and a red line so that they could alchemize it, so that they had work, but not too much, so that they were shaken up, but enough to get something out of it, to actually begin struggling. And this week I was reading some Vedantic material about Hindu scholars that travelled from one village to another and debated their philosophy with another yogi and to see who was going to be victorious. Is that really what wisdom is for? For being victorious in a debate? Isn't that all just Babylon, as Gurdjieff has described? So are we meant to bask in the light of ancient wisdom? Are we meant to argue about our philosophies? Are we meant to always be positive or are we meant to struggle with our negative emotions? What's the answer? Where are we going? Well, I heard Prabhupada say this week that the sense of independence and freedom comes when you're in the flow of the cycles of Krishna. Because that's what it means to worship God. It means that you feel the flow of the cycles. When I was at Maimon's, trying to experience the entire realm of impressions, I would say that that is love. What human beings mean by love is probably some kind of sincere contact with the third story. But our people have a very long way to go. You know, they say that they are negative, positive, but I tell you there are more than two emotions in the world. Emotions are just like the flowers and the trees. Each one is a differently coloured drop of rain. And they can be learned and experienced, and they can be expressed. That's another thing about people. They expect to feel something rather than give emotions, rather than shine in a certain way. Humanity has tried to wake up from the animal realm, but suddenly taking your life into your hands, you see that there is so much to do. And mostly people die without having really explored any of them. The level of technical knowledge that society in general has, and even spirituality and religious groups, it's very small. It's not sufficient. It should be much greater than that. The hydrogens. Let us begin with hydrogen 768. This hydrogen is defined as food. In other words, hydrogen 768 includes all substances which can serve as food for man. Substances which cannot serve as food, such as a piece of wood, refer to hydrogen 1536, a piece of iron to hydrogen 3072. On the other hand, a thin matter with poor nutritive properties will be nearer to hydrogen 384. Hydrogen 384 will be defined as water. Hydrogen 192 is the air of our atmosphere which we breathe. Hydrogen 96 is represented by rarefied gases which man cannot breathe, but which play a very important part in his life. And further, this is the matter of animal magnetism, of emanations from the human body, of N-rays, hormones, vitamins, 
and so on. In other words, with hydrogen 96 ends what is called matter, or what is regarded as matter by our physics and chemistry. Hydrogen 96 also includes matters that are almost imperceptible to our chemistry or perceptible only by their traces or results, often merely presumed by some and denied by others. Hydrogens 48, 24, 12 and 6 are matters unknown to physics and chemistry matters of our psychic and spiritual life on different levels. Altogether, in examining the table of hydrogens, it must be always remembered that each hydrogen of this table includes an enormous number of different substances connected together by one and the same function in our organism and representing a definite cosmic group. Perhaps I can say more about that in the future. So this week I lit a candle one evening and did some work with it. I said my normal sequence of prayers and pointed them directly at the center of the candle, putting a lot of force into it as if beaming the prayer into the middle of the candle. I tried it for 10 minutes or so. And what was the result? Nothing. Nothing, nothing at all happened. But I guess that's the joy of being an engineer. I know very well when nothing is happening, and I don't lie about it. Maybe I'll try again in a different way. A quick word about America. Three things. The Statue of Liberty, the American Dream, and have a nice day culture. I realize now that these three things are actually not American and they arrived after the race mixing began over there. America was originally an all-white country and it looked like this. These are the founding fathers. They took a strange decision to become a race mixed country. Initially, it didn't have any effect at all on the white population, but today they're down to 60% and falling quickly. I've learned now where these three elements come from. The Statue of Liberty was actually a gift from a French left-winger who wanted to encourage the race mixing of America. The American Dream comes from a book from about 1930s, and the Have a Nice Day comes from a 1950s movie with the plotline of wife swapping. None of these things come from a living culture that has a future. Cultures don't exist on the basis of freedom or of a dream. There is no such culture. Cultures are like a tree, like a cherry tree. It doesn't have a dream. It has roots in the soil. It has a good foundation. It has grown up piece by piece, which means that it's a family structure, which means people are of the same race, the same mind, the same religion. It means that they grow on the basis of being one tree. And anything that is not like that, any utopian dreaming, is the sign of death, because it means you start to mix things together. And if you mix the roots of a cherry tree, with the branches of an elm tree and the body of a sycamore tree, everything dies. The culture dies, the economy dies, the families die, the whole thing is dead. All of which is quite obvious and the Founding Fathers knew it and everybody really knows it. Today in Israel the Jews are ethnically cleansing the country so that only Jewish people will control that country. They don't want any other influences there. And for what it's worth, I think it's a good idea, although I think they should build a new city for the Palestinians in an Arabic country, instead of the war that's going on. And of course, that's exactly what the Germans were trying to do in Europe. 
all of which points the finger, I'm afraid, at the UK and the US, that have pretty much destroyed themselves trying to save the Jews, who are now doing exactly what the Germans were doing. But in terms of the spiritual journey, it seems that only an organized religion can cohere the intelligence of people and keep them together and keep their minds focused on the job, that solar light coming into them. So then you could say that the problem really began in 1500 when England broke away from Catholicism and lost the integrating light of God. And over time, they've become fragmented and have a distorted view of life. And now, if you go to Croydon in South London, almost everybody you see there is either brown or black, and the country is on its way out, unless it takes drastic action. But since World War II, British people have been taught to hate being white. It's hard to see how that can change. So the destiny is the bottom of the sea. And as a seeker, you have to understand the laws of life because they are inviolable, they are inflexible, and you will lose your life a hundred times before they change. It's stressful for me to talk about these subjects, but since they're right on top of our head all day long, it is important that I mention these things and not be another one of these utopian spiritual fools who pretends nothing is happening outside. Bring on the dancing girls! Get rid of this idiot! Fuck you! Off! But let's go back to the story of impressions, and this time we'll hear from Mr. Ospensky. Hydrogens come from different levels of worlds. You must remember the ray of creation. What is the difference between different worlds? Take 3, 12, 24... World 3 is under the direct will of the Absolute. There are only three laws there. In World 6, mechanicalness has entered. In World 12, still more mechanical, and so on. But 12 has an enormous advantage over 1536. So an impression that comes from 12 is one kind of impression, and an impression that comes from below the Earth, say from the Moon, is different. One is light matter, full of vibrations. Another is full of slow, harmful vibrations. You cannot stop impressions altogether, but you can isolate yourself from a certain kind of impression and attract yourself another kind of impression. That is when you know them, then you can attract desirable impressions. We must begin by understanding that certain impressions must not be admitted. The first step is avoiding wrong impressions. People stand in a street looking for street accidents, and they talk about it until the next accident. These people collect wrong impressions. People who collect all kinds of scandal, people who see something wrong in everything, they collect wrong impressions. Impressions have an extraordinary range. In the food diagram, we take hydrogen 48 as a standard. They are indifferent impressions, so to speak maybe of one kind, maybe of another kind, but in themselves they produce no effect. They reach us as 48, but in our ordinary state they don't go further, don't develop. They produce no effect. Man wouldn't be able to live in these conditions. But there are many impressions of 24, not as many of 48, but a certain quantity of them, and in very rare cases there may even be impressions of 12. But let's talk about 24. So man may receive not only 48, but also 24. In an ordinary man who does not learn to remember himself, these ordinary impressions, 48, are also transformed. But in quite a different way. They are developed further, or helped develop further, by reactions of a certain kind. For instance, by laughter. Laughter plays a very important part connected with impressions. Again, remember I said, in an ordinary man. With the help of a laughter, many impressions 48 are transformed into 24. But this is only because it is necessary for life. You remember I said that the chemical factory works by itself. It produces all kinds of very precious materials, but it spends them all for its own existence. It is nothing in reserve and nothing with which to develop itself. So if man wants to change and become different, 
if he wants to awaken his hidden possibilities, he cannot rely only on the mechanicalness in himself. He must look for conscious means. In man's organism are such wonderful inventions that everything is taken into consideration. Everything has its own key, so to speak, so that each function that looks just like a useless expression of something like laughter helps us to transform certain impressions which would simply be lost elsewhere. Here I think I begin to understand what they have been trying to do a little better. Gurdjieff had studied magic, and in magical techniques there are certain ways that you can hold the body, you can move the limbs, breathe in a certain way, and an unusual effect will happen. You use the vehicle that we are in as a kind of mannequin to create different energies. That's a rather strange and indirect kind of religion. But from this understanding, Gurdjieff was able to recreate the original design and the original problem for human beings, which is that they had fallen out of being part of Kodol duty. What Ospensky is talking about here is a careful marshalling of the energy inside of us so that it feeds ourselves at a higher and higher level and try to bring all the energy into a more and more vivid state, which implies that the energy is being refined at a higher and higher level. But I think what is missing here is a kind of immersion into your essence, a kind of devotion and the love of your soul. That is something that is not very much expressed. Because in fact, of the different functions that we have, the mental, the emotional, and the sensual, it is possible to enter them in a much more profound way than you may think. Not that you have feelings, but that you are immersed in them. And I don't mean immersed like a Latin drowning in emotion, I don't mean that. It's more like you're consciously immersed in them, so that they flow out of you, so that you express them. And in that way, you achieve the same results that Ospensky is looking for, but without this technical tinkering, more with an immersion into yourself, which is a far more natural way of being. Because the question for me is, even if you were able to produce all these energies in your machine by standing on one foot, laughing at a certain time, twisting your head, observing yourself. It's a rather unnatural way of living, isn't it? The fact is that human beings barely know themselves and they destroy themselves simply out of total ignorance. They don't respect the laws of family and nations. They fall out of it very easily. And then they and then they destroy each other in great wars. But what they don't have is some kind of spiritual devotion. Okay, quick story from Marina Hands. Never pity money was a piece of advice constantly given to the assembled company at the table. Mr. Gurdjieff used to tell us that every morning. He would go around to my cafe in the Rue des Acacias, sit down and order a coffee. Although he had no money to pay for it, every day someone came and saved him. Indeed, by the end of the day, he would find his pockets which had been empty in the morning, were crammed full of money. This he did not like to keep for himself, he said, so each night before going to bed, he would empty his pockets and throw the money he found there out of the window. One evening, when I had been doing some shopping for him, I took him my purchases and some change. He took out a large roll of banknotes and added the ones I was returning and put the lot back into his pocket. Greatly daring, I said, Oh, Mr. Gurdjieff, isn't it time you threw all that out of the window? He looked at me with an expression of utmost gravity and replied, You know, Igu, Sometimes I make joke.